Welcome everyone to today's event. We're honored that T. Bowie is uh, giving the keynote address and we're looking very much forward to uh, hearing her comments and having a discussion. Um, she's the author of the Big Read book selection, The Best We Could Do. And all of you know that Eastern's very, very fortunate to have received a National Endowment of the Arts grant to join other universities and it's across the country, not just here in Connecticut. Um, and with their local libraries. So it makes Miss Bowie's book a community event, and that's an honor that she has bestowed upon our community. Thank you. I love the Big Read program. Every year I try to participate because it puts books with social and cultural significance into the hands of entire communities. And given the divisions in our country right now, this is really important that we do this as a nation. At Eastern, we know that reading is the most fundamental intellectual skill we have. It's every base, the basis for every discipline. Every other academic skill we can master begins with reading. To celebrate reading is to celebrate the enormous potential in each individual. T. Bowie is a first generation immigrant. She came to the United States in 1978 as part of a wave of people fleeing Southeast Asia at the end of the Vietnam War. I'm old enough to remember that and how chaotic that was, uh, T, for you and your family. The Best We Could Do has been selected for an American Book Award, a huge achievement for an American. The book focuses on Miss Boy's family's immigration to the United States during the Vietnam War. But what's so interesting about her book is that it took her 12 years of research and writing to finish the story. She didn't just whip it up you know, right after her family's arrival. Now, at the age of 42, she has published one of the most important graphic novels in this country. This 336 page memoir illustrates her family's life in Vietnam, their refugee journey to the United States and her own life building her Vietnamese American family here in this country. It's not a simple story. It's very complex. T. Bowie wanted to speak about Vietnam and the war in her own voice, and she needed time to develop those ideas and the intellectual framework around it. When she finally decided on the graphic novel as her means of expression, she needed to teach herself how to be an illustrator. And I commented about the illustrations behind her, uh, and you'll see them when she speaks. They're, they're incredibly graphically beautiful. She is a self-taught graphic novelist. So, why is T's compelling story so important to us? Ultimately, her book teaches us how to say no to fear and yes to truth. Simply said, yes to truth and no to fear. It is an honor to have her here, and I want to thank you for sharing your family's experience in this wonderfully illustrated novel. We look forward to the discussion as well as your presentation. I want to take a moment to thank Julia Whitner, who's our gallery director, and Christine Jeffers, who's Jeffers, who is uh, the grants officer for Eastern, for successfully receiving a national endowment for the arts Big Read grant. It took them a lot of work to get to this point. I also want to thank all of our faculty and the students for inspiring us to apply for the national endowment of the arts grant. And I want to thank NEA and the Arts Midwest for the grant. Also. My word of thanks and appreciation for the support of the Connecticut Humanities Council and Bloomfield Public Library. And finally, Dr. Jason, I want to thank you for moderating this session. Dr. J Dr. Jason Chang is Associate Professor of History and Asian American Studies. He's also the Director of the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute at UConn. We'll forgive you for being at UConn and for serving as today's moderator. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, I think Jason, it's in your hands. All right, I think what we're gonna start with, our plan uh, for this afternoon is uh, for T to, uh, to share a bit about our work uh, and then, um, and then we're going to field some questions from the audience and we've made a decision to, to expand that time, uh, and to, uh, to, to then, you know, spend more of our time together in conversation. 
Uh, and so he's graciously, you know, like come prepared to share some, uh, some, some, of, you know, some visuals, some images of her work uh, that can uh, perhaps help out. So, um, so, you know, we wanted to, you know, make sure that we have uh, ample time for, for dialogue after this. Um, uh, President Nunez, thank you so much for that wonderful uh, introduction and it's a pleasure uh, for, you know, to have this kind of partnership and really look forward to more, uh, more work together. So, T, Am I on now? Yeah, yeah, you can, um, you can take it away. The stage okay. is yours. Gosh, thank you so much. Um, President Nunez, that was a really personal um, introduction that I was not expecting. It's the introductions I usually, I'll be very honest, my time to um, space out and, you know, collect myself um, before speaking, but um, you've, You've really uh, shaken me up here with how you, I feel so seen, as the kids say. Um, so thank you. Uh, we're going to make this personal, everybody, because um, there's really no point in doing things unless you're really all in, right? So this is a book that I struggled with for a very long time, um, and it's got a lot of tough things in it. Um, Things that are tough to talk about, right? But that's the beauty of a book. Um, there are things that we go through in life, um, especially, uh, I mean, everybody has this in some way, or shape or form, but I think with immigration stories, there's so much of that experience that gets There's so much of that experience that gets uh, packed away and it's hard to pull it out. It's hard to know when to pull it out because it has nothing to do with your present day. And it's really not cool to pull it out in the middle of a cocktail party, for example. No one, no one knows what to do with, with your baggage there. Um, but it is so essential um, to your being and who you are, right? So you have to let it out in some form. And I found that a book was the perfect vehicle to do that um, because I could wrestle with all of my demons and, and make sure that I was doing it in a way that was um, comprehensible. And then I could just slide it across the table to you uh, for you when you were ready for it. And um, I'm so thankful for all the facilitators of those conversations. Um, without them, my book would not have reached you. Um, I apologize that it's required reading. I hope that it didn't take away from <laughs> the pleasure of your reading. Um, but I am really grateful for the, the scale of, of things. Um, it's really beyond my wildest dreams. And honestly, um, you know, as life dreams go, I've now fulfilled my life dream to make this book, to, to write this love letter to my parents and my, my country of origin. Um, so I'm good, you know? <laughs> I, I just wanna spend the rest of my life being useful in some way. So I did get a chance to debrief with uh, Dr. Jason Chang um, beforehand um, to, to just learn a little bit about this audience. Um, and I understand from uh, Dr. Wintner that um, themes of immigration have come up, themes of um, belonging and, and uh, reactions to, to new uh, waves of migration, whether they be positive or negative, have come up. So I'm going to sort of tailor my talk today to those themes and those concerns. And I'd love to hear what other concerns you have. Um, I also remember very vividly what it's like to be 19, 20, um, and figuring out who you are. Uh, so I'll be talking a lot about that too. So um, if you'll permit me, I think in words and pictures. So I'm gonna show some pictures while I talk. So um, we'll do a little show and tell first. Um, the book is uh, getting to travel the world. It's getting to live in new iterations. This is a, a cover in progress right now. I, I need to proof this as soon as I get off with you. Um, this is for the Taiwanese edition of the best we could do. Um, this is for the mainland China edition. Um, and again, beyond my wildest dreams that my book is out there like another person, like a grown child kind of. 
um, getting to have its own relationships with people in the world. And it's incredibly exciting. Um, but back to the origins of it, when it was just a seed in my head, um, this was a note that I made to myself to tell myself to state my thesis, basically what I was trying to get, what I was trying to do with this project. And my baby, my son, who's now almost 16 years old, was just a baby then. And I said to myself um, that I hold my baby close and write with confidence that some things are good to forget, like childbirth. And some things should not be forgotten, like history. And I collect my family stories not because we are special or different, but because they're necessary for me to piece together, to remember the reasons why we left Vietnam, why there was so much bloodshed, and why no Vietnam War movie has ever answered my questions. So I was a 20 something year old angry graduate student who had a lot of beef with um, not just popular representations of the Vietnam War, but also a lot of academic writing about the Vietnam War. I felt like it was stuck in this binary that wasn't true um, because the Vietnam War or the war that was in Vietnam, you know, uh, existed before the Americans got involved. I mean, it was a civil war that was complicated by becoming a proxy war, right? And so it is very difficult um, as a Vietnamese person to talk about it in solely American terms. Um, and then also it is difficult as a minority right, in the US to um, have to constantly explain who you are and, and why you're here to people. Um, and it, it gave me this face a lot. Um, I was constantly looking for representations of myself uh, that I was not finding. Um, and then eventually I had to make the book that I wanted to read. But <clears throat> here's the thing about being younger, right? Um, or being a minority is you so often have to de define yourself by what you are not, which gives you a really funny picture. Um, it's all in negative. Um, and giving myself the opportunity to make a book was claiming back that real estate for the things that make up not who I am not, but who I am. And that turns out to be a very difficult project um, because uh, I guess it was very paralyzing. I was sitting on all of these interviews that I did with my family members as a graduate student, and I was um, feeling quite inadequate as a storyteller. I didn't know how to do them justice. And uh, my thesis advisor, uh, a wonderful woman um, named Dipti Desai, she kept quoting Edward Said to me, saying, all forms of representation are violent. And that was completely paralyzing to me because I did not want to do any more violence um, to my family members or to my people who had already experienced so much violence in real life. Um, and it was actually the process of having a baby that um, uh, sort of unlocked the key for me because the baby has got to come out. You just have to do it. Um, and so that's how I approached the book. Eventually, I, I just had to try um, and then I kept iterating and reiterating until I got it close to right. Um, I started to look at different things too, not just at myself and who I am not or who I am, but the things around me, the small things that go unnoticed that make up a culture, a people. Um, and the thing about uh, when you come to the U.S. as a refugee, you don't have a lot of artifacts, right? Like, actually, that is the, art, the, the artifacts of poverty are not too many belongings or the belongings that you just sort of have because that's what you can afford. But they do actually make up a culture. Um, and so I started to honor those things. These are actually um, the end papers for uh, a children's book called A Different Pond, written by another Vietnamese-American writer named Bao Phi, and which I illustrated. Um, and I asked Bao, what were the artifacts of his childhood? What, what were the objects that meant things to him? And they're very specific, um, things like the incense um, stuck in a rice bowl or um, the, the book that he remembered reading or the toys that he had, the few toys that he had or the pack of mind paper on which he wrote his first stories. Um, uh, the jar of milk mum, um, the fish sauce that his mother mixed in an old mayonnaise jar. 
And then there were some very specific Midwestern things, because uh, he's from Minneapolis, um, like hot, uh, what's it called, tater tot hot dish, and uh, jello with the fruit inside that he remembers from the um, lunches at the Lutheran church that sponsored his family. Um, I don't know those things, but they were specific to him, and I thought that they were important to include. It turns out that specificity is what helps your art have a universal impact. Um, the more specific we can get about who we are, the more real we become to others. Um, I also spent a lot of time reconstructing memories, which meant drawing myself as a child a lot, and that turns out to be a very therapeutic process. Um, learning to have compassion for yourself, uh, for the things that you went through as a child, and, and um, just feeling tender towards that child really helps you put some of the stuff in the past where it belongs and not carry it with you always on your shoulders. And actually, that applies to anybody that you're upset with. Just draw them as a child. It'll be very easy to forgive them. Um, and then, you know, as therapy goes, um, some days are just quite overwhelming when you open up the Pandora's box that is the past. Um, and if the past was difficult, uh, some days you just have to let the sadness wash over you. This was a sketch I did. Um, so I was sketching a lot in the days that I was drawing this book. Um, having a healthy sketchbook practice is a big part of um, being an artist. Um, there were days where I did more crying than writing or drawing, and that was just part of the process. Okay, here is uh, something related to a question that I've always wanted someone to ask me about, but no one has ever asked me about the little bio that I have in the hardcover version of The Best We Could Do. It mentions making mixtapes um, from records onto cassette tapes. It's a lost art. Um, I spent a lot of time listening to my dad's records, and he had a lot of Paul Simon and Simon and Garfunkel and the Beatles, and uh, no one has ever asked me if that influenced my writing. It totally has. Um, see if you can find the page in my book that is related to this quote about, you know, a window in your heart. Um, there was a, there's a clock, there's a, a very kitschy clock, a wooden clock in the shape of Vietnam that I think almost every Vietnamese family in the diaspora owns. Um, we had one of those and I spent a lot of time staring at it and, and imagining kind of a, a, a hole in my heart, the shape of Vietnam. I think that comes from this lyric. Okay, so that's a little bit of context to lead you into this passage that I'd like to read that I picked out just thinking about what it's like to be um, uh, a young adult stepping out of the shadow of your parents, um, but feeling always uh, linked in some way that you can't quite put your thumb on. Have our parents ever looked at us and felt slightly disappointed? Such high hopes, so much possibility to fall short. And though my parents took us far away from the sight of their grief, certain shadows stretched far, casting a gray stillness over our childhood, hinting at a darkness we did not understand but could always feel. These are the people I come from. Ma, bo, lan, big, ti, thumb. I figured out more or less how to raise my little family. But it's being both a parent and a child without acting like a child that eludes me. My parents escaped Vietnam on a boat so their children could grow up in freedom. You'd think I could be more grateful. I am now older than my parents were when they made that incredible journey, but I fear that around them, I will always be a child, and they a symbol to me, two sides of a chasm full of meaning and resentment. Travis and I moved to California in 2006 to raise our son near family, trading the life we had built and loved in New York for a notion I had in my head of becoming closer to my parents as an adult. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I recognize what it is not, and now I understand 
proximity and closeness are not the same. How did we get to so, such a lonely place? We live so close to each other and yet feel so far apart. I keep looking toward the past, tracing our journey in reverse, over the ocean, through the war, seeking an origin story that will set everything right. So that was my, um, that was my treasure hunt. And did I find what I was looking for? Yes and no. Um, the vehicle was the, the vehicle was the book. The book was the vehicle for asking questions. It's not a memoir in the sense of like a Greek person sits down and tells you how they got to where they are. It was really never meant to be a memoir. Um, I was an oral historian by training um, it was meant to be an oral history, um, but I am also very conscious about communication and how we, you know, communicate um, difficult ideas to each other. Um, I also was trying to get revenge against all those bad Vietnam War movies, and <laughs> I was doing it on a budget. So I was looking around at different media, and I figured out that, or I just had a hunch, I just had a hunch that the, the medium of comics making a graphic novel, a graphic memoir might just be it. And of course I was influenced by some amazing books like Mouse by Art Spiegelman and uh, Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi, which is deceptively simple looking. But here's the thing about comics. We uh, cartoonists are really the, um, the, the floor tile layers of the literary world. Like if we do our work well, you just sail right over it and you don't even notice and it looked, it was very fun for you to read in like an hour. It took me 10 years. Um, if we don't do our work well, uh, you trip over it. So hopefully you didn't trip too much. Um, so like I said, a sketchbook practice was a huge part of the making of this book because um, some of the thoughts arrive fully formed and some are very raw when they come. A lot of it was just spent staring at these old folks who um, were my parents, trying to figure them out, uh, trying to puzzle them out. Um, and I, I realized that there's an opacity to photographs that I really had to, to do without. And so it, it's on purpose that there, oh, there's only one page where you ever see any photographs used. And I purposely left it to almost the end of the book so that you can spend most of that time uh, in the book, getting to know them as characters, um, which feel like people with, um, you know, hopes and dreams and faults and funny expressions and, um, you know, things that make people human, you know, like I'm a, just a, a two dimensional image in, in your computer screen, but like, you might hear my stomach grumble. And I hope that's a reminder that I'm just a human being in a body. Um, and that was what I reminded myself every day as I was working on the book. These are human beings in bodies. What do bodies need to do? They need to eat and sleep and laugh and talk and go to the bathroom. And, you know, so those are the things like specific, like the specific objects I was talking about earlier. Um, those human needs also make us who we are. And the places that we live in really shape us um, and give texture to our life stories. So I spent a lot of time looking at Vietnam, um, trying to access it uh, through whatever I could find. Um, it was a little bit hard in the US to find you know, accurate representations of Vietnam in the past, but um, I'm a research addict and I, I just kept going and um, sketched and sketched and sketched until I could like sort of memorize the logic of a place so that I could invent scenes that I needed to recreate when I was reconstructing memories. And then I had witnesses, uh, my siblings, my, my two older sisters were incredible witnesses and I definitely incorporated their perspectives into the stories that I told, even though as a storyteller, I had to whittle down who the main characters were. Um, but I owe a lot to uh, both my older sisters and my younger brother who were witnesses to uh, these family stories. And then the last step I think was connecting the, the characters to the places in which they lived. Um, this was a powerful moment for me where I was reconstructing a dream that I had 
and um, you know, pulling back at this angle and redrawing the tiny apartment that I grew up in that felt so big, it was my whole world. But being able to pull back and look at it as though it was just a stage set um, was another powerful part of like being able to externalize uh, the pain, um, the painful memories, and uh, be able to look at them from a distance with some remove and some compassion for all of the people who played a part in that human drama. Um, uh, there was a chapter, uh, chapter three used to be called terror because it was, you know, about being scared all the time as a little kid. And, uh, the way that I got in the mood, the way that I got, the, the way that I prepared myself for working on that chapter was to rewatch every scary movie that my parents let us watch, uh, when we were inappropriately young. And, uh, I figured out that they were not scary to me anymore. Most of them. I figured out that uh, they relied on a lot of cheap tricks, like, uh, you know, a sudden, sudden scary music or a jump scare. But the 1 movie that was still truly terrifying to me was uh, Stanley Kubrick's the shining. And I figured out that the cinematography had a lot to do with that. So I picked up on those hallway shots um, and that. You know, when I drew them, they were a 1 point perspective, which is great because 1 point perspectives are simple to draw. Um, and if you lower the angle to be, you know, so that the camera is looking from the angle of a small child, then you see a lot of the ceiling and that unlocked. Uh, images, like the 1 you see on the right here. So, um. I'm often asked uh, what was the most difficult part of the book? Um, some of it was like reliving difficult things, but it turns out it was also cathartic uh, to be able to put those things into form and, and then be able to step back and look at them. And then people sometimes ask me what were your favorite parts to draw? And those were always nature and water. Um, actually, before I figured out the whole book, I had this very loose outline that was kind of just thematic and abstract. Every, uh, every chapter had a short description and a cryptic metaphor about water. <laughs> that was what I sent to the editors in the beginning. And I have no idea how they understood what I was going to do, but it worked because it was sort of a description of not what happened in each chapter, but how each chapter was going to feel. Um, and there's a little bit of vicarious living in these scenes. Um, I have never gotten to lie under the stars and the moon like that in Vietnam, but my mother describing it to me and me drawing it, um, drawing that memory um, kind of lets me do that through her stories. And water, I think, is a powerful metaphor to me because it has played such a role in Vietnamese history, um, so many people lost their lives or encountered violence on the water. Um, so water was both a life giving and a life taking force. Um, and so many of us can't swim. It's really interesting. Um, a lot of people couldn't swim, even though they were like throwing their lives to the wind and, and putting everybody on a boat. Um, and I think that added to the tragedy. But um, I don't know, I, I, I suppose I still remain fascinated and scared by the water. And when I, when I turned 40, I treated myself to some swimming lessons finally. Um, so I'm less likely to drown now. Also, my son has trained to be a lifeguard, so he will save me. And then water um, as rain, you know, and uh, again, like it was such a, such a such a blessing um, as for a storyteller to, um, you know, just add some element of like real life and scene setting to these memories that were so, somewhat displaced. Um, my, my parents would tell me stories like, you know, we would often go to the movies. That's a habitual action. How do you turn it into a scene? Well, you take a little bit of what you know uh, about the weather in Saigon and you know that summer storms are really common occurrence and the sky, the sky can just open up and pour on you on your way to the movies. So just imagining that 
that happened one night when my parents went to the movies helped me so much um, bring these memories to life in a way that um, I guess helps you feel like you were there with them, I hope. I think I just put this here because I wanted to look at it again. <laughs> Um, I am asked a lot about color uh, and why I chose that specific red orange color. Um, you know, the answer truly is that it was cheap to do one color. Um, black and white printing is the absolutely most inexpensive way to print art. Um, but color, as you see in the difference here, adds so much emotional depth um, that I knew I wanted to have some color. And then it was just about picking the right spot color. Um, I went through, you know, like a thousand Pantone uh, library options, tried out a graphic novel blue, a, a more reddish color, uh, a more gold color, until I finally found this um, color that makes me think of like the dust that comes off the bricks and the, the golden afternoon light in San Diego and the color of um, the orange apartment building and um, the, the way that our old family photos, the Kodak photos from like the 1970s and 80s are starting to lose all, their, all of their color except for the, the red orange tones. And here you can see what it looked like when it was just plain ink on Bristol paper. Um, another thing that helped me a lot, and this actually just goes back to asking questions as an oral historian, was perspective. Um, it was really important for me to step out of my relationship with my parents as their child and to just ask them questions as though they were people um, not related to me. So instead of asking them questions about myself, I had to really, really um, learn to see them as children or as a fellow adult and uh, just respect um, their hopes and dreams and, and thoughts uh, outside of me. And then um, one of the last things I wanted to talk about was um, the power of juxtaposition. Um, I learned from talking to therapists that um, people who, who are still struggling with trauma, um, the, the past and the present are blurred. Things that happened in the past feel like they're still happening and that, that is the effect of trauma. Um, and so juxtaposing the past and the present to me um, just unlocked a way to, to represent trauma without ever using the word. And then that visual device unlocked for me a way to tell my A story and my B story at the same time. You know, the A story being my family's story and the B story being the, 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 the global events that were happening at the same time that they were living. I had never known that there was a connection between my family's history and US, the US-Japanese war. Um, but there was, and it was awful, um, but it really important to the family story. And so I just juxtaposed them and uh, that let me shortcut through a lot of 20th century history. Um, there may be some writers and artists in the audience. So I, I put this image in there for you. Like, what does the process look like? Kind of looks like this. There are scripts with tiny notes on them. There are tiny drawings and stacks and stacks of these. Um, the editing process is brutal because unlike writing on a word processor, you can't just move paragraphs around. Anytime you move like one panel or, or change a, a page, like you have to recompose many pages. Um, and actually at one point I had a month to edit a 400-ish page manuscript uh, down to 320 pages. That's cutting 20%. It was really hard. Um, but at the end of that month, I felt really art buff. Um, and there's just something great about teaching your, your muscles to um, write quickly. And this is actually writing in comics. Like you're writing with words and pictures in sequence all at the same time. And um, you need to teach yourself how to like shorthand facial expressions, actions, um, and uh, the pacing of a scene all at the same time. When you get there, though, it feels really, really good. Um, actually, I'm going to stop there, Jason, in case that's there, in case anybody wants to ask me about 
what's next. <laughs> um, I'll happily talk about that, but I did want to stop a little bit early so that we had a chance to have more of a dialogue. Mm. Dee, thank you so much. That was that was beautiful, and um, I loved seeing the sort of the backstory to some of these panels and seeing your process. Um, I want to encourage the audience to use the chat to uh, you can you know tell us where you're where you're you're viewing from, um, and also you know share questions that that you have. I know for my students, I've asked you to um, to come prepared with some. Uh, some questions that we discussed. Um, so please use the chat. You know, maybe one way to get started, um, just going off of, you know, President Nunez's um, very powerful introduction, um, I thought maybe I could share an activity I did with my class that tried to you know, um, use the brilliance of your story, the way you've depicted this intergenerational story um, as a way to, um, for people to think about brave conversations for themselves and their own families. And um, so it kind of distilled some of the, the dramas and some of the, the, the panels, especially, you know, you actually showed one of them where it shows you, um, the, the four panels uh, speaking to your father as a child. Um, and so there, there's a basic kind of set of prompts. So, you know, say, um, I am the child of, and then name your parents or your older generation. Um, I remember a memory of them. Um, and then the sentence, my parents struggled with, and then for them to complete that. Um, then using one of your panels that shows your neighborhood, but has this question and, you know, in a, in a block um, that wasn't ever verbalized to your, to your folks, at least at that point in the story. So I asked them to write a question that they've never asked of their parents. Mm -hmm. um, and then going to that model that you have of those four panels, uh, speaking to your, your father as a child, um, ask them to imagine the response. Um, that their parents had, speculate why they um, would respond that way, and then you know, write down a wish that you imagine they might have for you, but not verbalized. Um, and then for them to use some of your drawings as uh, as a kind of template for them to depict themselves and and um, and their families. And the range of questions were just so wonderful and and very challenging, uh, but I think it speaks to the way that that uh, the courage and bravery you've taken to share this story and in, in, in the manner that you have, uh, it opens up pathways for folks to, to see themselves in uh, an intergenerational context that maybe isn't always accessible to folks. Yeah, it, it's relationships are so complicated, right? And I can imagine if your parents are thinking this hard about how they talk to you, they might maybe admit to, um, you know, and I, I say this as a parent myself, like the things that they say to you are so much about this pressure that they feel to take care of you and to do right by you and, and to make sure that you're going to be okay. Like, I, I don't know that I really want to be spending so much time asking my son, have you eaten yet? You know, <laughs> But I have to, because this is my role um, and it, it's tricky to like step outside of our roles in this parent child dynamic. Right? Um, and uh, yeah, I think folks here are the a really great age to do that really interesting experiment of what happens if you step outside of that role for a second and ask each other different kinds of questions or give each other different kinds of answers than you, you've been used to. What do you learn? There's probably a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Michael uh, Rouleau, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, asked through this process of object, uh, uh, getting to know, of trying to objectively get to know your family through interview, how has your relationship or impression of your father changed? Uh, the book was a really great way to spend quality time with him. Mm. Um, it 
it it was the way to not talk about things that I don't want to talk about. Like I don't want to talk about dinner. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't really want to talk about health problems. Like I know I'm supposed to, but like, it's not exactly how I want to relate to my dad at all times. It's so much more fascinating to ask him questions about his life and it opens up a lot uh, from him. Um, so much that actually when we were at the end of the project and like the, you know, the final manuscript had been sent in, he was still coming over and like telling me more stuff. And I, I was like, oh no, I can't put, <laughs> I can't do anything with this anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, you know, that reminds me, um, you know, one of the things, one of the experiences I had that made me want to be a historian was um, I was asking my my grandmother about her childhood and you know, she kind of stopped me like mid-sentence and, and she was like, why do you want to know about me? My story doesn't matter. No one cares about what my story is. And it like broke my heart. Um, but it also demonstrated to me, you know, like that some people, there's like this difference between like history with a big H and then the history that, that we know. Um, yeah. And you spoke to that, this sort of AB story, um, which, you know, that is, is so wonderfully, you know, uh, woven throughout the text. Um, yeah. So. Anyways, that that was uh, a really wonderful um, connection that you know um, that it sort of inspired me to be a historian, but then also the connection to your work. Yeah, There's... the big history, <clears throat> the big history that we read in 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 our textbooks, is like the history of the victors usually, right? <clears throat> and um, it was a cool. Uh, it was a cool writing exercise for me to like flip the perspective and go, I want to write about the losers <laughs> and what it was like for them. Um, so, um, one of my students is here, uh, Johnson Huang, uh, he writes, what is a, a piece of advice that you have when trying to branch your story to your parents? I'm second gen Vietnamese American going to Yukon and was raised by my grandma while my parent was born in 72. My grandma has passed, so I want to know more about my parent living in Vietnam and traveling to the US, having me, and then getting divorced. Um, <clears throat> great question, question Johnson. Um, uh, it, it, it depends on how reticent or how willing they are to talk. Um, sometimes you're lucky and you've got parents who are talkers and sometimes um, they're like, well, why do you, you know, no, let's talk about something else. Um, if, 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 uh, if your subject leans towards the latter and doesn't really want to talk, um, then it can be useful to come at them with artifacts and ask them about the object rather than them. Um, so like pull up a picture and ask them to like tell you like, when was this taken? Like, where was this? Like, who else is in here? Tell me about the background, you know, look at the background in photographs more than the people sometimes and like pick up on the little details like a detective and ask them about those things. Always ask them about concrete things rather than big abstract things. Because if you think about having to answer the questions yourself, how easy is it for you to answer some question like, what was the most challenging part of your life? Like, you don't know, you're probably just gonna make up an answer, you know, to please the person so you can like get back to making lunch. Um, but if the person asks you, like, um, you know, what did you wear when you start when, on your first day of school? Like, did you have shoes? Like, what kind of shoes did you wear? Like, you know, did your siblings, like, you know, like, or where did you meet my dad? Um, what were you wearing? What, you know, what did he talk to you about? What did you like about him? The more specific the question, the more concrete the question, the easier it will be for the person to like pull those reserves out <laughs> and, um, and and give you some material to work with. And then it's your job to compile and then start to analyze and then come back to them with sort of hunches that you have about what their story is. And then you get, you sort of propose it to them, like, this is what it seems like the story is. And then they'll, then they'll respond to you. But you have to do a lot of the work of piecing together the details. I love those suggestions. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, uh, paying attention to the backgrounds. Um, you know, I always love visual evidence as a historian, looking at old photographs and and um, sometimes you want to see an actual person, but sometimes the context just tells you so much about the situation and, and the framing of, you know, where the photographer was positioned and, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about all of those pieces of you know, visual evidence is so rich. Um, I want to come back for a moment to uh, something you had mentioned before about, you know, using Kubrick's, you know, uh, angle, camera angle as a way to dramatize the position of the, the, the point of view um, that's used in, you know, throughout the graphic memoir. And, um, you know, I'm struck by the way that, um, that there's a sort of children's narrative that is woven through that. And did you, you know, besides having a kind of dramatic effect, was that, you know, um, was it a conscious choice to, to draw from that, from that perspective as to, from a child's perspective? Yeah, there's a, um, there's an old essay by Chin Ti Min Ha, um, that like asks you to like take different perspectives and one of them is a child's perspective and they're all like um i think all of these like thought experiments are about like just trying to empathize put yourself in the shoes of another person um so that you can learn right um and i think that everyone has been a child so that's an easy access point or it should be an easy access point um I was very conscious about audience and I wanted to make, I wanted to leave access points to all kinds of readers um, and having so many scenes about children and their experiences and how they understand the world was one way for me to um, make the book accessible to a, an unknown, hopefully pluralistic audience. Mm -hmm. It, that actually speaks to one of the questions um, that Quan Tran, my colleague, uh, is at Yale, who's uh, uh, as a historian of, um, a, of uh, the Vietnamese diaspora and looking at the oral histories and and other ways in which uh, the you know, Bo people have have made uh, made home in in different places around the world. Um, and looking at how those places are memorialized and and written into um, you know larger uh, cultural fabrics, and she asks, could you speak to how the graphic memoir has been received within and outside of the Vietnam uh, Vietnam American community? Um, I was pretty nervous, honestly, the first time I was asked to speak to an older Vietnamese American audience up in Seattle. Um, it was uh, it was I um it was chosen by the Seattle Public Library as their like one city one read book and they set up talks around the city in different environments. And I was used to you know I was, I was used to talking in an academic setting. So I love love talking to college students and high school students, um, general public book festivals, all of that. Um, I had never spoken to an entirely Vietnamese elder audience before. Um, there was a translator because I'm not that confident about my Vietnamese. And at one point I just like, I just told him it's okay. I'll, I'll try. And so I, I got up and I spoke um, to the elders in Vietnamese and I always start with my apology that my Vietnamese is not very good. And they're like, it's fine. It's fine. Just go on with your talk. Um, and they were hilarious. They were so badly behaved as an audience. Like they, like there were phones going off. Like somebody like got up and answered a, a a phone call in the middle of my talk in the back. It was very much like hanging out with, you know, your Vietnamese elders. Um, it was amazing and they loved it. You know, they were so supportive at the end. Like one of them stood up and she sort of gave a speech about, um, you know, me telling their stories and, and, and doing them proud. I'm so relieved. Um, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's a terrifying experience making something for your people, because what if they hate it? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a gamble because my politics are not exactly co completely aligned, you know, with the, the hardcore anti-communist um, 
uh, politics of, of, of many people, uh, many of the elders in the diaspora. Like, I will not go to, you know, the parades where we wave flags and, and things. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I feel very relieved that I have not been caught up in um, any sort of binaries that, that exist from folks having lived through a really hard civil war. Um, and I'm grateful that they feel that I'm use I'm of use, you know, to um, humanize our stories and to help more people understand them. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Lane writes, um, how often do you journal? Um, I'm terrible now. I, I was really good when I was working on this book and in a different pond, but um, the <laughs> The one downside of having your book do well is that you end up, you know, talking, <laughs> talking more <laughs> than you um, write. So I think I maybe need to uh, get better at hiding from the public so that um, <laughs> I, I, I am a more disciplined artist. Mm. Yes, I can relate. Okay, here, Sophia Gonzalez writes, uh, were there other thought exercises that you partook in to help you create the book besides trying to view your family story through different perspectives? Um, you know, to be very honest, um, I had never drawn a, a graphic novel before doing this book. So part of why it took so long was it was a lot of trial and error. So who knows what I did? Um, there are some things that I have learned since doing it that I can share with you that will be more succinct. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten about writing is try to make, try to create scenes. Like we understand things in story, but when we tell stories, especially nonfiction stories that have to do with the past, we often sort of blur the lines uh, between all of the moments that happened. And we, we say things, oh, there goes my stomach for a moment. Um, we say things like, you know, we would often go to grandma's house every Sunday, that kind of thing. Um, and that is a nice story for telling over tea, but like when you, when a reader reads that sort of thing, they cannot enter into any one of those visits. You need to choose a visit to grandmother's house and really give concrete details and choose a specific moment in place and time. Um, to focus your energy on as a storyteller if you want to draw your reader in. Um, so the thought exercise will, would be things like, well, was your stomach grumbling on the way? <laughs> you know, um, what was the light like? Um, what did you hear? Um, how did you feel in, in anticipation? How, what, what was the look on grandmother's face when she saw you? Um, things like that bring the humans forth and bring the human stories forth in a way that reach the reader better. Mm. Yeah, that's a great, um, it's a great exercise, great recommendation. Uh, it reminds me of the uh, conversation we had with some of the other uh, high school teachers that we're working with who are uh, been, you know, courageous and, and uh, to step up to, to teach your, your book in uh, Connecticut high schools. And one of them had this in, ingenious way of talking about the uh, a, a, a reading the text with emotion uh, and trying to identify how you were able to characterize uh, emotion without the words, just the visual depictions, and um, and that you know to to develop a kind of vocabulary, a visual vocabulary as well as a, a, a linguistic vocabulary to talk about emotion. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, your process of, of showing emotion, um, yeah. because it, it's yeah. so connected to the story, just how you were characterizing that, that thought process of what aesthetic choices do you want to make to convey those things that aren't actually, you know, textually written? Yeah. Um... I took out all the descriptive language as I was as I was drawing because I no longer needed it, right? Because it existed in the artwork. Um, and so for me, the text 
the words needed to be as pared down as possible and almost as emotionless as possible because there was going to be so much um almost sentimentality right in the in the in the in the visuals like i have a very i i tend towards the beautiful like i really like things to be beautiful and the color was going to be very emotional and so for contrast i wanted the text to be very spare um because I think otherwise it would have lost a balance. And and I also needed there to be um, a lot of conflict played out in silence. Because in contrast to say, uh, Mouse, um, where the characters play out their conflict in like arguments and stuff, like my people are very silent, they hold it all in. And, and so I had to um, convey the conflict through pregnant pauses and, you know, things that are unsaid. Um, and so things happen, things happen in your imagination between the panels and in, in looks. Um, I also pared down the, uh, facial expressions or, or the, the facial features as much as possible. There's a great book about sort of comics theory called, uh, understanding comics by Scott McCloud. And there's one chapter where he breaks down why we, uh, why cartoonists simplify faces it turns out like the less specific the facial features the more universal they are um which is kind of what the opposite is it's sort of the opposite of what i told you about specificity earlier the less specific the face actually the more emotion you can convey um so for me you know how was i going to draw like specifically vietnamese or asian faces and also like specific people and also show them all these emotions um i had to develop a shorthand and you know the, the the stereotype of the Asian eyes, you know, the being slanted and all that. It's like not actually the, all that helpful, because um, then no one has any expressions and everybody looks the same. And if you look really closely, that's not how Asian faces work. Um, for me, it was about the nose. So like I don't have much of a, a a bridge. So like if you look at how I draw my nose, it's just the bottom line, um, and the open face gives me a lot of like you know room to play with just very simple shapes, a dot and a curve, um, a little squig squiggle here and there. Um, all of these things shifted slightly up or down or closer together, create those um, expressions. And uh, it, it, took a, it took a minute to let go of everything I'd learned from my formal art training to learn how to cartoon like this, but that was a big key. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of the, you know how masterfully you've you know you've designed those those pauses you know those you know, pregnant you know, silences you know between the frames um just many examples of that throughout and um you know it does you know i think that speaks to you know one of the reasons why it resonates with the vietnamese you know refugee diaspora community in a larger way because of, you know, as you said before, that, you know, trauma blurs the past and the present. And, um, and so, you know, giving, you know, sort of, um, you know, voice to those silences allows people to kind of step into that space, which they maybe don't want to, but you've done it for them. And <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You can, you can sort of talk about your family by talking about my family. <laughs> Um, it would be really useful, I think, if we had a Vietnamese translation of the book. And I've been working on that for years, but um, getting it published in Vietnam is difficult. Um, there's still there's still quite a bit of censorship uh, around certain topics, and it's it it's impossible to censor a graphic novel without being very obvious. Um, so yeah, we haven't been able to do that yet. So I'm trying to find a workaround, seeing if we can. Um, find a, a smaller publisher to mm -hmm. create the Vietnamese translation just for the diaspora and distribute mm -hmm. it through the U.S. Wow. Well, I wish you the best of luck on that. I think it's going to be amazing. Um, you know, that, that might, re might relate to it. another question I have. I don't see any new questions. Oh, here. There are more questions here. Um, oh, let's see. Um, Riley Rolna, uh, Roldan writes, was there any pushback in pursuing art growing up? 
Um, I was the lucky third child, you know, one, one sister went to med school, the other went to law school. So that took a lot of the pressure off. Um, I will admit that's a <laughs> huge privilege. Um, but actually my father, um, my father really liked the idea of having an artist in the family. Um, but he, his idea was like, I should go to like a two year college and, and, and get out early and start working and help support the family. And I was really lucky that my mother, um, said, no, she put her foot down and said, you need to get like a solid education. Mm -hmm. Um, and that let me go to UC Berkeley and, um, pursue, you know, my other passions. So I got just, I, like many immigrant children, I double majored, um, in art and legal studies. And I thought, you know, actually up close to graduate up till close to graduation that I would go to law school and um, become a civil rights lawyer because um, I was inspired by ethnic studies and learning about the incredible work done by advocates. Um, it was my sister in law school at the time who talked me out of it and said, you'll be much happier in art school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh is a great advice from the older sibling. Um, yeah, we have another question from Sophia here, which he says, she says, I, I know a lot of immigrants, especially those who migrate involuntarily, particularly as children, feel a sort of imposter syndrome, like internal conflict, when they try to define who they are versus who they are not, as you said. Did you ever go through something like that? And if so, how did you work through those difficult emotions? Um, yeah, no, the, the imposter syndrome is real. It, it, it's, it's every day um, it, and it has to do with a lot of things. Um, but the yeah, imposter syndrome around one's own culture, like that whole binary of like, am I Vietnamese or am I American? It's a false binary. The culture doesn't really work that way, you know? Um, and when you have elders who are imposing um, their version of, you know, the original country's culture on you. Sometimes you don't like it just because it's old, <laughs> like, to be very frank. Um, like, I didn't want to do ribbon dancing or, you know, because it, it's kind of, I just didn't want to do it. Um, but I really enjoy listening to Suboy rap in Vietnamese. Like, that's cool. Um, so, you know, I, I I, my parents and their their generation they were they expressed a lot of anxiety that like my generation would lose our culture and become completely Americanized, but like I wrote a whole book you know about <laughs> about our country and our people and I talked to the young folks and like a lot of them speak really great Vietnamese because they go back to Vietnam and they use their resources they use the internet, um, and they're like. They're continuing to add to the culture. Culture is dynamic. You are part of the culture just by being you. So reject the false binary. Be you. Be curious. Um, and don't be ashamed either. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that connects to um, sort of connects to another question um, from Jolie Budzinski. Uh, she writes, "Hi there. I'm a high school teacher at Connecticut River Academy." Thank you for sharing with us. My students who are here with me would like to ask, did the writing give you some kind of closure or did you have more questions than before? Mm, that is a really good question. Um, it, it was such a struggle to create the book that, you know, when it was done and my dad was still coming over with like more, more stories and I, I was just kind of like, that ship has sailed. You know, like I was given the opportunity when we, when the, when the paperback was coming out to like add back in some pages, because I had had to cut, you know, 20% of the, the story. And I was like, no, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm good. Um, so when I look at the book now, it is full of flaws. Like I don't look at it and say, oh, that is masterful. I kind of cringe mm -hmm. at a lot of, of, of the pages, mm -hmm. but I also have learned to have compassion for myself. Like this book is a time capsule of what mm. I was able to do at that time and what my understanding of things was at that time. And that's fine. This is what we make as humans is records of our existence um, and records of who we were and our own biases and limitations when we made these things. Um, I'm completely comfortable with that. And I have so many other burning questions now that drive me uh, and make me want to make new work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know from my own experience that, you know, when a 
going down a research path. I love what you said before about being a research addict. <laughs> um, you know that in the, in the pursuit of a question, you you end up learning stuff about yourself. Uh, you end up learning, you know, about other things that you didn't even intend to learn about. And, uh, and that just that process of opening up yourself to this kind of genuine curiosity and uh, it really is, you know, takes you to places you, you didn't intend to go. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, whether that's, you know, emotionally or, you know, for, you know, your own internal narrative uh, or also just that it physically takes you to places you didn't intend to go. Um, yeah, I would say just hang, if you have that in you, hang on to it for as long as possible. And, and it helps with the imposter syndrome because it distracts you from it. Um, there's so much pressure that we put on, on ourselves to perform and to do like what we think people are expecting from us. And that makes you miserable every single time. But if you want to be happy in life, like follow your, follow your passions, like pursue the things that you're interested in um, approach life with questions rather than statements and, and you'll, you'll never be bored. <laughs> um, I, I would like to follow up that question that what you just said there with um, asking you a little bit more about your, um, your grant from fund for teachers uh, mm. and how that, how you pursued that and um, and how did it contribute to your teaching? Um, I'm really invested in, in seeing, you know, teachers in Connecticut become more confident and competent to teach Asian American and Pacific Islander studies. And, and I think the fund for teachers is such a fantastic program. Um, could you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, uh, growing up, um, poor, like I knew that my parents were not going to be able to send me to college. So I, I started the hustle really early on. I think that's, that was like my first experience as a writer was like writing all these essay applications to convince people to give me money. Um, so I got really good at that. And, and then I continued it as a teacher, mostly uh, all of the grants I got were to like get stuff for my students. Um, the one thing that I got for myself was the fund for teachers grant. And that let me go to Vietnam. Um, and take my mother as my guide. Um, so we went to all the places that we had lived in as a family and I asked her questions while we were there and interviewed people and just took in the country because um, I really had only been there once before as an adult. Um, and that was a huge, huge part of the visual research for the book. Um, mm -hmm. When I came back, you know, it wasn't like I was going to come back and sort of whip out the book in the summer before school started. It was more like, okay, now I have a process uh, to share with my students. And so, um, and you know, this from teaching is that it takes up a lot of your time and energy and you don't have too much juice left at, at the end of the day for your own artistic practice. So I was yearning to work on this um, book, but I was teaching full time. So I made my students do the project. Um, I had them tell their stories. I had them, do oral histories with people and draw them as comics. Um, and later on, when I moved to California and um, started Oakland International High School, I, I went even deeper because all of the students there are immigrants themselves. Mm -hmm. So I had them tell their immigration stories in the form of comics um, so that I could, I could work on mine vicariously <laughs> through theirs, through being their editor and guide through the process. Um, so I have a huge, I have a huge um, uh, like debt to these students who taught me so much about that process um, mm -hmm. and sort of pushing them to, 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 deep, to dig deeper into their own stories taught me a lot of these questions that I, you know, used these thought exercises that I'm sharing with you today. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, it, you know, maybe oh, this might be a nice time to uh, if, if you have any thoughts on the role of art in an in interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary education. Um, you know, I love that you're combining illustration and oral history. And I read somewhere that you teach a class called like, graphic oral history um, class. I would love to take, <laughs> uh, but uh, if you could speak a little bit about, because, you know, the, the way that the art or, you know, putting yourself into uh, 
mode of creative expression, I think, you know, provides these chances for, um, for knowledge to be combined and articulated in ways that a sort of disciplinary kind of you're just doing, say, sociology or psychology, just those, the, the, the connective tissue between those ways of knowing. Mm, yeah, I think art keeps you humble. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people think of like artists as like these highfalutin folks, and, and maybe that has to do with the pedestals that like artists have been put on. But I think that the process of making art really, really keeps one humble um, because it's hard. It's hard to make things um, and it keeps you accountable to your audience. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I feel like I can BS a lot easier <laughs> in an essay or in an email um, or in a talk but I'm really trying not to. Um, in art, I can't, because you'll see it. Um, mm -hmm. And you were saying earlier, uh, before we started, Jason, that like, I think Zoom has um, turned us all a bit into production engineers. Like, that's part of the humbleness of, I'm talking about, of making stuff is like, you need to, you know, you, you need to make things look good on the page. You need to like pay attention to page margins and your font and, you know, your color and your paid, your paper that you print on, you need to worry about all of those things. And they're not um, irrelevant details there. They're, they all add up to make the end product. So I spend as much time like handling those sort of like nitty gritty concrete details as I do like working with like um, themes and big abstract ideas. So, um, I think when in education, we, we set our students up to make things. Um, I love project based learning. Um, it helps them connect all the dots. You know, they understand that learning isn't just the big ideas and, and, and um, the abstract concepts. It's also um, how you put it all together to share it with others. And I think it gives them some ownership also for the knowledge. So it's not just a regurgitation of things that they were that they heard and then they put Put it, put it back together, but like having to decide what you're going to make, um, and then having the courage to like actually like go forward with a vision, and then do learn all the skills that you need to make it. Um, that really makes you own own mm. your learning process. Mm. Um, well, in in those those choices of what to do and how to tell the story, uh, Kathleen Holzer uh, 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 writes. Did your siblings agree with your version of the past in, in this book? Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, consent is really important. <laughs> um, so they they had all seen like drafts and things ahead of mm -hmm. time, and actually um, they had like all read like transcripts of their interviews. Mm -hmm. So I was constantly checking in with folks before this ever went to the editor. It would have been a terrible idea to just like publish this book and then have them read it. No. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself if, you, if you're ever working on this kind of project. Um, my my brother held off reading it till it was all done in um, galley form, and he he told me the best thing. Um, he said that he always knew that um, he was uh, like excited about it, but um, and that he would be proud of me. But um, he actually felt like gratitude after mm -hmm. he read it. And that was huge, huge to me, um, because it meant that he, he liked the way that I did it. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, we have another question from, uh, from my colleague, uh, Quan. She writes, um, one of the things that I really appreciate about the best we could do is how far back you push the timeline for thinking about Vietnamese American history and stories and the stories in this work. Do you say more about how you think of the concept of time and history in this? Um, I would like to add a little bit onto that just to ask about, um, let's see. So in addition to that, that bit about you know drawing this longer kind of arc past, you know, you had mentioned going beyond the beyond the war narrative uh, of the Vietnam War. 
Um, but then I'm also thinking of the ways that the story of Vietnamese independence struggles can also be interpreted as decolonization. And is this an association that you think of? Um, and how do you define decolonization? And what role do refugees play in um, the diaspora in that? <laughs> Jason, that was a multi-part question. <laughs> I'm going to try to break that one down. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah no, uh, when um, the title of the book changed when I figured out that it was a lot about parents and children and not just mm -hmm. about refugees. Um, and then also the, the through line became more apparent to me when I realized that it was about yearning for independence, whether it's a child yearning for independence from their parents or a, a country, a people yearning for independence from colonizers and imperialists. Um, and the, the cost, the incredible cost that comes with fighting for freedom um, and the complications that arise also when people don't agree what that looks like. Um, so yeah, it was important to go way back. Um, decolonization, it's a hard work, right? It, it, it requires up, upending the power dynamics, but it also requires going deep into one's own um, personal biases, really, like decolonization for me with my family, there, there's like microwaves of doing it, like just questioning, um, gosh, is like European magi really better than Chinese magi? Like, I don't know. Let's look at the ingredients. Wow, the Chinese one actually doesn't have any MSG, <laughs> and it costs like a quarter of the one from Europe. Like, I'm hoping that there are folks in the audience who under, who, who know what I'm talking about here, um, or you know, just kind of reconciling like the fact that like we have like funny, you know, it's made with like French bread, and it's, it's such a part of like our like Vietnamese food, right? But it's like this French thing that like got added on. But then like, you know, looking at the Vietnamese language um, that are, you know, before we were, we were given this alphabet that was created by, you know, Portuguese and French missionaries, um, we used Chinese, Chinese writing system. And so much of our, our, of our language comes from China. And so, so much of our dominant culture comes from China. So decolonization is like a never ending process of like pulling back the layers and pulling back the layers. And I don't know that you ever really get to the center. Um, part, I think the layers are part of the culture also because culture is dynamic. And so we have been shaped by all of these um, forces. Um, and I, I, I would never ever, ever agree with somebody that, 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 that uses um, the, that as any sort of justification for colonization. But I think I just sort of accept it as the reality of the, the impact of colonization is that culture gets muddled. Our waters have been muddied and th these are the waters from which we, we, we were born. Um, and so I think just in our existence, we're, we're, we're huge puzzles and problems. Um, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to look through here for questions. Let's, I, I will add one more thing. I, similarly, you know, it's weird for me to be writing a book in English, right? <laughs> like, but I can't do anything about that. That is the language that I speak and write best. So here you are, this Vietnamese kid um, <laughs> writing a critique of American intervention in Vietnam in English. Mm hmm yeah, which I think, you know, it speaks to the importance of these fields of ethnic studies, you know, not just Asian American studies for holding those spaces and for, for, you know, demonstrating the, um, um, that these aren't just, you know, individual narratives, right? That these are stories about, uh, about the nation, about, um, uh, lots of different experiences beyond even now looking at the, um, uh, the the uh, refugee crisis in Afghanistan, right. um, 
you know, like these are, you know, experiences that kind of, you know, transcend because of those connections to um, complicated relationships of power and, you know, you know, and imperialism. And those aren't things that can, you, you know, um, uh, there's a lot of inertia of movement um, and yeah. history. Yeah, um, sometimes the 24 hour news cycle can make it more confusing rather than <laughs> rather than like sometimes you I feel like I learn less um by watching the news too much because you get lost in the minutia um and you forget the big picture. And to me that is the role of stories and storytelling mm -hmm. and storytellers is that we need to we our function is to remind people what are the stakes and what is what's the bigger story of what's what's happening here. And sometimes those stories take decades to unfold. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the spirals of history um, are, you know, decades apart, mm -hmm. but people who have lived it and really paid attention, like the folks who remember the fall of Saigon, like understand what's happening with the fall of Kabul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just reflecting on um, the, here in central Connecticut in West Hartford, where I am, there's a Vietnamese, you know, community here. And they had a um, a night market uh, that was going on uh, like every other weekend you know, for some part of the the the, um, the fall the summer and into the fall and um, and it was so amazing to see you know hundreds of Vietnamese Americans just hanging out cooking amazing food and um, and then to think too that you know some of them hadn't seen each other in years. Um, and from what other folks had, had shared was that some of them hadn't seen each other since, you know, since arriving in the United States. Wow. And it made me think about the ways that communities kind of evolve and change over time and that it took basically 40 years for this community to grow and, and into this the place where it is now and uh, at the cusp of learning about new Afghani refugees coming to Connecticut at the same time as having this experience of going to these night markets and seeing this joy and this community, um, you know, really thriving. Um, it, you know, just really brought the, the kind of, um, uh, the gravity of of that history and mm -hmm. uh, the, the historical moment that we're in. Yeah, the um, the tragedy. Well, there's there's many tragedies, but one of the tragedies of Afghanistan is that they've already gone through a refugee crisis. There mm -hmm. are already refugees here who came at the same time as Vietnamese refugees, mm -hmm. um, you know, fleeing the the Soviet invasion. Um, and I hope that, you know, that community having roots here will um, really help the newcomers um, find, you know, find a way to survive and mm -hmm. thrive as well. Um, I'm part of some Vietnamese American efforts to um, welcome refugees and get folks humanitarian parole um, to, you know, it's just a drop in the bucket, but, mm -hmm. um, our, our, our histories are so intertwined. Mm -hmm. Well, we're almost out of time, but I want to have, leave the last word with, or the last question from my student, Karen Lau. Uh, she writes, hi, T, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for this, um, this book. When she has, when your son reads the best we could do, what do you hope he'll learn from the book and your family's story of survival and overcoming war? Well, this is a sensitive question, <laughs> you know, teenagers are, they're going to be them. Um, and I think it's like part of their growing process to like, not be you. So, um, I'm trying to like tread lightly, you know, <laughs> and not, not try to impose too much of me onto him. Cause he'll just reject whatever that is and do the opposite. And I don't want that. I don't want the opposite of me. Um, so I'm trying to give him lots of space to be him, um, whoever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, I do hope that he learns to be tough. You know, the one thing I'm very proud of my family is the resilience. We, we can do a lot. 
like we can handle a lot. We've been through some acute family crises in the years since their arrival. And um, I'm really proud of my siblings for how they step up um, when things get hard. Um, I think immigrants are a really incredible self-selecting group of highly motivated individuals. Mm. But you definitely want immigrants on your side because, you know, people who can cross oceans and thousands of miles with nothing and rebuild, you want them on your team. Um, so I hope he, I hope he inherits some of that toughness and resourcefulness mm. and resilience. Mm. That's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you for that. Um, I want to thank everyone who has been involved in, in the big read, uh, grant and, uh, for this partnership with ECSU. Um, there's you know, just so many people who have, have encountered who have loved this work and are excited to bring it to new corners um, and um, and just to share, you know, their experiences of reading it. Um, I hope it is, uh, you know, an, an event that we keep on, you know, coming back to um, or a, a text that we keep on coming back to and uh, seeing the ripples of these conversations extend. Uh, into our communities, into our families. And I'm really just grateful for being a part of this. Thank you. Me too. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good night.